It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Laura DeVore. Hi, Laura. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Douglas? Doing fine, thank you. Do you prefer to be called Doug? No, Douglas is fine. You got it right. Uh, thank okay, you very great. much for coming on this show. I appreciate it. And uh, Thank you for having me. As we were just talking about, uh, my voice is not well, and anybody who listens to the show know that I'm sounding like someone else right now. So you'll have to uh, forgive okay. me. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I'll do my best to get through this. And uh, let's see. You are an author, and your book is called Darkness Was My Candle. It's a pretty traumatic book. Yeah, this is your life story as a child? That's correct. That's correct. Well, it sounds it's, like... It's both, both a book about trauma, but it's also a book about transcendence and about redemption because of the kindness of strangers, people who came into my life one after another at pivotal times in my life and taught me there was another way to live other than what I was living as. So just very quickly, all of this sort of abuse was at the hands of your parents? Um, there was only one parent, one my parent. mother. Okay. Um, my, mo my mother was an unwed mother, and there, I don't know for sure who my father was. It could have been many different people. And um, she really stopped developing at about age three when her father froze to death in a blizzard and her grandmother and my grandmother, her mother got catatonic and they lived in northern Wisconsin on a small farm and it was during the Great Depression. And so the oldest sister went to work in town and all the siblings took care of themselves essentially. And so she stopped being parented at age three. Um, and she was the second to the youngest. There was a, a brand new baby and then the siblings that were a little bit older than her, but certainly not old enough to really care for her. Uh, so how many kids were in your and family? There were, um, in my mother's family, there were, there were eight of them. So there were eight of you all living in one house? No, this was no, no, this was my mother's family. In my family growing up, I was the only child. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Yes. And my mother, um made a living as a prostitute and prostituted me for the first time at age nine. And life was pretty dark for a oh. lot of years. Um, I had, had already had so much trauma by fourth grade. I, I didn't know how to read yet. And I think the teachers had given up on me. And one of those strangers um, who was incredibly kind, a substitute teacher kept me after school one day and had a conversation about why I thought I was having trouble reading. And one of the things is they always put me in the back of the room and I couldn't see the board. I needed glasses. And, and, and I was afraid that I couldn't read because I'd seen the teachers get disgusted and give up on me so many times. And this substitute teacher within a week of being there literally shifted my life. And so I became an avid reader and, and still am to this day. Did the substitute teacher know about what was going on with you? No, no. You know, I think for anyone, even in this day and age, whether you've been raped or whatever is happening, um, there's a great deal of shame around it. And um, most perpetrators try to con convince a child that it's their fault for one reason or another. Yeah, yeah. But, but no, I did not talk about that with anyone and felt a great deal of shame for my mother and our lifestyle as well as um, when she started to sell me. I, I felt I was certain that there was something inherently wrong with me and i and i also didn't believe that i had a right to live but and, and I, I because she told me so often that i had never been wanted and i i felt like an alien who'd been born to a hostile planet and couldn't understand why anybody would want to be here and had it not been for the kindness of a neighbor when i was nine shortly after the first time my mother sold me and i, I didn't tell her what was happening but she and her husband had figured out that my mother was prostituting herself because of the parade of men in and out. But the day she was moving away, she pulled me into her arms and just held and cradled me and kept murmuring that she loved me. And something came alive in me in those moments. 
And I, I felt like I now knew why I was here, to learn how to love, to learn how to receive this thing called love and learn how to give it. And it was almost like lightning struck me that day. And so that's been a saving grace probably my entire life. Wow. The other thing that's beautiful about that story is years later, I'd written a short story about Dale, which was the neighbor's name. And I hadn't seen her in all those years. And this is probably 20 years ago now I found her. And she had never forgotten me. And she was working as a poor cleaning woman. She had a second grade education and had been considered mar- marginally intelligent. And she, um, but she had this amazing heart. And she, not long after I found her, she was diagnosed with lung cancer. And I visited her and I started to weep and I said, Dale, I'm so sorry it took me so many years to find you. And she reached across the table and she said, don't be, don't be sorry because you did find me and now I'm not afraid to die. I know I did one good thing in my life. Just look at you. You're like a ripple that goes out. And then she asked me if she needed me, if I would come. And I said, of course I would. And so I, I tend to be a dreamer and I pay attention to my dreams. And one night I dreamt all night long. She was calling me. And at that point she'd been in and out of a hospital for palliative radiation. And I called her home. There was no answer morning after I had that dream. And I called the hospital and she was actively dying. And so I got on a, a plane and got there before she died and got to be with her as she took her last breaths, which was such an amazing gift. Because uh, yeah. I always cre- credited her as one of the people who saved my life. Now, was there no child welfare services where you were? This was pre-child protection years. Oh, okay. So I was eventually, I, I was eventually taken away from my mother. And uh, but I was supervised by the juvenile justice system because they had nowhere to put kids like me. And um, I went from one placement to another and one was worse than the next or nearly as bad. And I was homeless the the month before I month, almost a month and a half before I graduated from high school. But I did graduate and got a couple of scholarships and went off to college. So the places that they put you, were these like foster homes or were they more like uh, institutions? Well, they weren't called foster homes. They were called placements back then since they didn't have a foster care system yet. And at one point I was in the juvenile, um, essentially (laughs) juvenile prison. It was for, quote, juvenile delinquents. So it was the local shelter for juvenile delinquents. And so I was there for a period of time. Okay, because on but your mo- most of the others were home placements. On your bio, it mm-hmm. says also uh, illegal pharmacological drug research and institutional abuse. Mm-hmm. So what was Correct. that about? So I went off to college, um, and I, you know, I was pretty street smart, but I wasn't. I didn't have any daily living skills, and I didn't even know I was supposed to sign up for a dorm, <laughs> and so arrived at college with a suitcase and wondering where to go at registration and they found a place for me to live but I lived three place different places that that year they just didn't have any dormitories and then I was working part-time as a nursing assistant at a small hospital in Chicago and I was being stalked by the respiratory therapist who had to be in his early 50s and he would show up in the halls at school and when I was at work he'd try to pull me into the janitor's closet and fondle me and then he oh showed up God. at the L stop one, one, one day and had it not been for a businessman who scared him off, he was trying to pull me into his car and I was trying to fight him off. I don't know what would have happened. So I quit my job and I was looking for another job, but, and I wasn't paying attention to some of the, the notes on the bulletin board. By now I was living in a, in a dorm situation and the dorm was going to be closed, closing and I had nowhere to go and now didn't have a job. And my old childhood default was believing, you know, I could just exit. I could just kill myself. And so I took a handful of some kind of probably just aspirin or something. That's the only thing I would have had around. And then I thought, I don't want to die. Why did I do that? And I made myself throw up. And then I went to find um, the dorm mother, and I told her what I had done and that I was scared and that I needed an adult to help me sort it out. And she said she could think of many jobs for me around the city and places where I could also get room and board, but she was going to put me in a taxi and send me across town to get checked out medically. So I was sent to an emergency room and I was fine medically. And they said, next thing, you know, they said they were going to send me 
across town to another hospital called Illinois State Psychiatric Institute for a few days of rest. And they, ISPE wouldn't let me out. I didn't know for many years that they were doing research, but um, I knew they were giving me drugs and I wouldn't take them. And I kept spitting the drugs out and and they started giving me liquid Thorazine and liquid drugs, and I would do everything I could to thwart them and eventually ran away, and they ended up getting catching me and eventually having me committed to the worst state hospital in the system. And there was a nurse at the first hospital who was so enraged about my commitment. The night that I went to court, she kept coming in and out, out of my room, and I felt like, I, I can't even tell you, I almost, I was so shut down And in such shock, I didn't know how I'd gone from being this college student with a hopeful future to now being a committed state hospital patient. And and in those days, it was for it was for life. You didn't get committed for a period of time, Uh, and it made no sense. And she kept coming in and out of my room and checking on me. And then, shortly before eleven, when her shift was going to end, she came. She came in. She said, "I'm going to come in and sit with you." till daybreak if that's what it takes to get you to talk about your feelings because you're not going to survive where you're going otherwise. And so she sat with me all night and then she told me that what had happened she felt was illegal and she was going to do everything in her power to get me out. Her name was Sydney Krampitz and she eventually did get me out and I write about her in the book and I also have some stuff on my website. I actually was able to um, get her recorded with her and I in a dialogue before she died last last November, shortly after Thanksgiving, and it took 15 months to get me out, and it was almost too late. I thought I was on a lot of drugs at the first hospital, well, the state hospital. I, I can't even tell you what a horrible place it was. Well, state mental uh, institutions <laughs> were notorious for uh-huh. many, many decades. It wasn't really until the 1980s That's right. yeah, that uh, That's right. a lot That's of them right. got shut down. That's and uh, that's oh. right. And, and this would have been the 1960s when this was happening. Right. right. So, I mean, you could have been luckily they didn't lobotomize you or do something horrible that was that couldn't that's be right. couldn't that's be right. changed. Right. That's right. I found out um, Sydney and I went back to Elgin and the state hospital I was in and visited there a number of years ago. And we went to the state archival library and did research and came across this document that um, came out after I was released, but they were doing an investigation around the time of the ending of my being there. And it was because of so many untimely deaths. I I was horrified, just horrified. And I realized people had told me that I could have died there, but I really got how close I was to dying there. Not only were they understaffed and they had they had one nurse per 500 to 800 patients the same with doctors wow and so the the wards were ruled and run by untrained um, attendants aides and aides and um and so forth and so they were in charge of the medication and they just get, gave it out as wi- at will and a lot of those untimely deaths were because of overuse of thorazine which creates um horrible constipation and bowel impactions. So a lot of people died of sepsis because of their bowels exploding Mm, because of all the thorazine they were being given. There is a happy ending to this book, right? (laughs) Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. I ended up going on to graduate school. I've worked in the world of mental health myself for many, many years and just have an incredible life. And I'm actually moving. My son bought this incredible property in Ohio and and um, we, we're a family that loves horses, and I have some grandchildren, and um, it has a wonderful mother-in-law suite, so, so that's why I'm moving to Ohio. But, uh, but I'm going to continue to do a lot of work in Minnesota, where I'm originally, where I've been living for the last 35 years. So I'll once, be going back and forth to Minnesota. So once you got out of that institution, did things mm-hmm. turn around for you at that point, or did it take something else? Slow, ab- absolutely, slow, slowly it did. I mean, there were other significant events in my life that I write about, but there were a number of factors that I think made a difference in my life. One was I had this tenacity about me always from the time I was a kid. Um, I had this thing in me that if someone tells me I can't do it and I internally say, watch me. But the last foster father that I had, last placement, he um, told me that he 
he thought that the only reason they took me is he thought he could help me amount to something, and obviously he was wrong. And and I remember having that, that same reaction, well, you watch me, I will amount to something. So I think that tenacity and that will help save me. And I also made a commitment to myself that I would not, I would not, I refuse to live my life with a leftover mental health diagnosis. And so many people get stuck in the mental health system. And even today, it's certainly not all of mental health, but some mental health practitioners believe that someone who has serious trauma can't fully heal from it. And that's simply not true. And I'm a poster child of resilience. You know, one of my jobs is working with an organization out of Washington, D.C. called the Center for Mind-Body Medicine. And that person, that, that work has taken me to the Middle East and to Haiti after the worst of the, the earthquake there. We worked with firefighters right. after 9-11. And down in the Gulf Coast after Katrina, we worked with students at, in Broward County after the shootings down there in Florida. And I wouldn't be able to do that work had I not fully healed from trauma. And that's brought tremendous, me- that work has brought tremendous meaning to my life. And I, and I know that people can heal even without seeing a therapist full time. If given the re- right tools and taught t- about how these amazing bodies of our work. A lot of people think that if they're stressed, they just have to be stressed. There's nothing they can do about it. If you're anxious, you're anxious. And that's not true. You know, some simple breathing techniques um, can make all the difference in in the world. And literally, you can turn off um, the part of your brain that's in fight-flight response. And so what we teach the Center for Mind-Body Medicine and a lot of my work has been about um, empowering people with tools so that they can fully move into a resilient and thriving life. Well, I think that's a great message, and I think it's a great message to end on. Uh, thank you so much great. for coming on and sharing your story. That was uh, incredible, to say the yeah. least. But I'm glad it did have thank a happy you. ending. Uh, do you have a yeah. website yeah. you want to give out? I do. It's Laura, L-O-R-A, DeVore, D-E-V-O-R-E dot com. Okay. And there are a lot of interviews on it, and, you know, the conversation I have with Sidney Krampus, and... And just a lot of, and also resources for people who, who might want to reach out to others for help. Okay, and there is uh, links to your book, or where people can can buy the book from yeah. there. Yeah, yes, yeah, you can buy it at Barnes and Noble and Amazon and just about any place that that books are being distributed today. Okay, yeah. great. Well, Laura, thanks so much for coming thank, on the show. Yeah, thank you, and I hope you feel better soon and get your <laughs> real voice back. I oh, I hope so. This is terrible. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, take care. Thank you. And it was an honor to be on your show. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Bye-bye. 